And we are here with Howard Waldrop. Howard, welcome to Fast Forward. Uh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, right. well, what I'd like to do is kind of go back to the beginnings a little bit because you started as a fan. Yes. yes. In fact, you were involved in World Combats. You were serious fandom. Pretty, pretty much, I guess you'd say, right, you know. Um, now, did, did you find, how did that lead you into the writing, or, or how did that it was, affect you? Uh, it's, it started, I was part of comics fandom when it first started, like around 1960, 61, and I was at first an artist, and I was doing like art for fanzines, and like spot illustrations, and like stuff. I was also writing stuff, you know, too, but I was doing art and spot illustration, and I started doing covers and things like that, and I became art director of a bunch of fanzines published out in California uh, around the Bay Area. Uh, the major one was called Cortana and it was a sword and sorcery uh, fanzine, you know, along the lines of Amher. Amher had already started about three or four years before, but ours was of course a cheap Mimeo production <laughs> instead of the nice slick offset in Amher like they printed, you know. And we didn't have, you know, Ellsberg de Camp writing articles for us and stuff like that. But it was, um, I started as an artist, and like it's, I was writing too. And at some point, I realized I was a little bit better writer than an artist, which isn't saying a whole lot back then. You know what I mean? Uh, and uh, I uh, just got involved with fandom. That, that you know, the SF and the, and the comics fandom overlapped uh, for about three, four years there because essentially SF, I mean, comics fandom came out of SF fandom and gave us a template to work with and stuff. And the, like the first conventions weren't until like 65 or 64, 65, stuff like that. It was a convention when like 12 guys got together <laughs> in one guy's house, you know, right? But but uh, the first real conventions didn't start till 65 or 66, you know, about comics. But yeah, I was, you know, uh, Tom Remy was in Dallas doing uh, Trumpet then, and uh, the uh, uh, there were several other fanzines being published around the area, you know, SF fanzines besides the comics fanzines. It, the Texas Trio, which is Buddy Saunders and Howard Keltner and Larry Herndon, was like the the premier like comic strip. I mean, it was an amateur comic book. It's what it is, but it was the one where everybody was trying to get in and trying to do artwork for, and you know, have people see their art and stuff like that. And it was they published ten or eleven, ten or eleven issues, and they were offset, you know, and all that kind of stuff. After about the third or fourth issue, the first ones had offset covers, but duplicator insides the usual you know stuff like that and I wrote a couple of stories uh, for them you know as they call them text stories see we didn't understand the reason that comic books had two pages of written material in the middle was for the postage regulation so they could be mailed as a magazine right so we thought all comic books had to have like stories stuck in the middle of them besides the comic strips and stuff so that was nearly everybody's, it was just everybody's template, you know, <laughs> right? So I wrote a couple of stories and stuff like that. And George, George R. R. Martin it started at the same time in comics fandom. And he wrote, you know, he wrote stories for them uh, also and stuff. And eventually, of course, the, it, by the late 60s and, and early 70s, we started the Big D in 73 bid for the World Science Fiction Convention which as somebody said essentially became Kansas City in 76, you know, when everybody from, from like Tom Remy and people moved up to Kansas City after the, the uh, uh, Dallas bid fell apart, you know, right? And I, I'm sure all that stuff, you know, all the comic stuff and all, of, all the fanzine stuff influenced me. I got, I got serious about the writing about 1966 and I sold my first, I sold my first stuff in 69 but as a couple of comic strips and, you know, an article and things like that. But uh, I sold my first story in 1970. So, and the, you I understand you found out about that when you fourth joined the day. Army. Four, no, well, I didn't join the army. Yeah, well. they, they came. You know, they, <laughs> the army they, joined you. The army joined me. It was the fourth day of basic training. I got. They had mail call, and uh, I got my. I got a notice that that uh, a duplicate of the check that John W. Campbell had sent because in those, those, day, those days he didn't send contracts and stuff. He just sent you a check, you know, if he accepted your story, you know, and, and stuff. And uh, I got to enjoy it about two minutes and then I got to do more push-ups or whatever we were doing at the time, you know, right? But that's the way I was informed that I'd become a science fiction writer is, is uh, in basic training one afternoon. Yeah, what <laughs> so, fun. <laughs> yeah, I know, yes, you know. You heard Gardner said the same thing happened to him, almost exactly the same thing happened to him in his career. Mm -hmm. But, but yeah, the chances, you know, your chances of being drafted were like 
pretty that was before the lottery system yeah, and all that. Well. So it was like, you know, yeah, right, yes, you know, you know how it is, right? But I had asthma. Which good. Saved me. <laughs> good. <laughs> good. I had an ulcer, but that didn't save uh. me, right? You know, so but uh yeah, that's uh the the fandom stuff was very I mean, like I said, you know, like people would publish almost anything, but of course people did notice when something was better than <laughs> the other stuff around it, you know, right? So it was, a, it was a quite quite good showcase for, like I said, George Martin wrote like 10 or 12, you know, story. He, he wrote, see, I usually didn't write like scripts for the comic, comic, uh, you know, for the yeah. actual comic book part of it. I would write the text stories as we in say, you know, in the middle and stuff like that. And, uh, but George wrote some script, actual scripts and stuff. And of course, Buddy Saunders, who was my friend since seventh grade, was selling to Creepy and Eerie and all those places. Oh. You know, he was a professional, you know, right? He was a comic book professional by then. And uh, then he became a comic book tycoon. He, he opened one, some of the first comic book stores in America, you know, right? You know, like, and then he, him and a couple other people were responsible for like him changing to the direct sales thing, you know, for comic, mm -hmm. just for comic book stores and stuff. But I used to have to keep a guy in a little booth up in uh, Moline, Illinois, or wherever it was that they published, Champlain, Urbana, whatever, where all the comic books were published. And he had to go get them from the comic book publisher and then bring them across the street and then box them up and send them to your comic book store. That was in the old days before they shipped them directly to the stores. You know, you had to have this middleman, you know, <laughs> right? But, but uh, yeah, the, the comic book stuff was, was just, you know, it was like a training ground. Yeah. It was a true training ground, you know. And, and, and you're, you're known primarily for your short fiction. Yes, short I hope story. so, you got, <laughs> if I'm known you got for a, yeah. <laughs> You've had a couple of novels, uh, one a collaboration, and you're, of course there's, Famous for the, the novels you've been working on for a long time. Yes, a long time. The, any day now, any day now, as we say, I've got a, a, sh a short novel that's due in at Subterranean mm -hmm. uh, December the first, which I've been, only been working on about twenty something. You know, oh. the idea only came to me twenty something years ago, right? And it all changed and stuff. But uh, the Moon World and I John Mandeville are like many years in the work, many, many years in the works. But what is it that draws you so much to the shorter forms? It's, uh, like like I said in one of the panels this afternoon, I said, if you read enough short, short fiction in SF and fantasy and stuff, ideas will come to you in a short fiction form. It's just it's just the way you're, you're conditioning yourself to think by like reading lots of short stories and stuff like that. If you read novels and stuff all the time, stuff will tend to come to you in the form of novel, you know, like a big, bigger, bigger thing, a bigger plot, bigger, you know, more characters, things like that. At least that's been my experience, you know, right? When a, when a no, that's why I know when a novel is there because it's not like the other stuff I've been doing, you know, right? But uh, uh, I, I, I just love I've always loved short science fiction, you know, short stories and mm -hmm. science fiction and novelettes. Somebody said that the best form for science fiction they thought was the novella, you know, the mm -hmm. short I've novel, like 20,000, 25, 30,000 words. And it's really true, the, like the examples of it from, from the best writers in the field or the best stuff they ever did. Yeah. It's not that they're novels or they're short stories, it's the, you know, novellas, like, like when Silverberg was hitting on all six, yeah. you know, and stuff. He was just wonderful in the novella form, you know, like Born with the Dead mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Now I'm Going Blank, yeah. right? Sorry, <laughs> sorry. But anyway, all this, that middle period Silverberg yeah. stuff, every time he would do a, a novella, it would be just wonderful, you know, and, and the short stories were great and so were the novelettes and the novels, but, but his best stuff was that, like, novelette form, long novella, long novella, long novelette novella yeah. form, like yeah. 25, 30,000 words. It's okay. great stuff. Yeah, it's great stuff. It's just great stuff. But you, you know, you spend time working on the short stories that you do, right? You don't, yeah. what I've noticed, yes, and from the introductions <laughs> and afterwards, <laughs> right. it seems like they're, you're, you're taking a lot of time and effort on a yes, right. short piece of As work that's not going to get you much money. <laughs> much, not going to get me much money at all. Uh, it's it's I, the the actual writing usually doesn't take that long once I know the story's ready to write and I, like I mentioned this afternoon it's not mystical it's that I know when a story's ready to write and I know when one's not you know it, there, it's missing something mm -hmm. that I want to be there to make it like work and to make it like logical and 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 you know magical to people and stuff and 
un, un, I've realized that now, but I've been doing this 36 years now, oh, I'm tired, uh, that, that uh, uh, if it's not ready to write, there's nothing I can do about it. You can't Except force it. I can't force it. I've tried to force them before, like, especially early on, you know, I says, well, I should be writing this about now, you know, and I start trying and it's not, it's not going right, you know, there's, because there's something that I haven't, like, once I can visualize it from beginning to end, even though it's not in chronological order, you know, like what happens mm -hmm. from beginning to end, then I can write it, you know, and there's usually some little piece missing somewhere that I haven't got past, you know, in my thinking. And then when that comes, I can write the story. Because yeah. something I've noticed, you know, going back and rereading a bunch of your stories mm -hmm. recently get to get ready for the interview. Right, <laughs> right. And trying to think, well, is there, is there like a Howard Waldrop kind of story? And there really isn't. They're all so different. And the form you use for the story, do you know, is that one of the things you need to get in your head before you write it is what the form is going to be? Because you've done stories that are written as, as magazine articles. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Things it's, like that, you know? It's, if I, if I can, if I can, like I was talking about ugly chickens and everything, I realized I had to stop and just do info dumps, which is just mm -hmm. telling the reader what he needs to know, you know. And once you get past that point, then I could then I, the story just wrote itself. But it was like getting to the point where I realized that I was just going to have to stop the narrative, tell people what they need to know, and then go back to the narrative and do more narrative. And other things of like a passing of the western. Did you read that one? Mm -hmm. no, it, because it's three parts, and one's a magazine thing yeah. from. Colliers or something. One's a one's a uh, one is a one is a like a, a Forrest J. Ackerman, yeah, Forrey Ackerman, Forrey Ackerman, <laughs> precy of a non-existent two real series of of things in the '30s, and it's an alternate America where there were the cloud busters, as I mm -hmm. call them, you know, rainmakers, yep. changed the way America, you know, the weather is in America in the 1800s and stuff, and made the prairies bloom and it's deserts bloom story. and I realized I had to how, how I had to narrate it I had to narrate it you know like get the envelope thing from the magazine mm -hmm. article and then do the do the parts it was the interview the with interview, the, with the yeah. sidekick right and the guy who played sidekicks for 85 years in the movies or something and then once you had those two parts then you could go to the Fari Ackerman part and realize that this series was based on fact and not, mm -hmm. you know, just a, you know, a movie series, you know, yeah. like like an alternate America. It was in the alternate America that, you know, this was taking place in. And you do a, you do a number of stories that are alternate, kind of alternate worlds and alternate histories that you do that same kind of thing where you slide that that knowledge that wait a minute this isn't the usual world that we know. Um, there was the one with um, Sir Thomas Wolfe. Yes, in the, yes, in, right, yes. After uh, the uh, Japanese you Olympics. Could, you could go home again. Yeah, yeah, he's coming back home from the 1940 Tokyo Olympics, which, like, you know, didn't happen <laughs> in our world, you know, and we didn't have Zeppelin service, that's, you know, that's the thing, <laughs> around it's when the world. You suddenly realize that he's he's in the Zeppelin. And not on a ship. And that, wait right. minute, this isn't our world exactly. It's just, it just, uh, just gives you, you know, goosebumps right. as you're reading See, it and going, whoa. In, in many in many ways, it's like a it's it's sort of like a cheap thing to do, to like l let the reader think for the first like ten pages that he's on a ship because the terms I use to describe mm -hmm. everything could take place just as easily on a ocean liner as on the Zeppelin. It's only when he throws the cigarette off the observation deck and you see it fall like a mile exactly. and a half, you know, right, that you know you're in a Zeppelin. And I I realized I had to do something like that. You know, to withhold like for the first like ten pages, the fact that they were on the Zeppelin, you know, to to set up the rest of the the yep. rest of the, the story, and uh, you know, like I said, I usually don't like when writers do that to me, but I realized that's the way I had to do this, you know, to mm -hmm. to fix to make the rest of the story work, so that's the way I did it. And uh, but the Tokyo Olympics thing, you know, would be that you know somebody say, oh, he's come back on an ocean liner from the Tokyo Olympics, and then ten pages later you realize he's come back on a zeppelin from the from the Tokyo Olympics, you know, right? But uh, that posited a world where the you know the uh, technocrats had actually had to take over in 1933 when things fell apart, you know, which is the backstory that's mm -hmm. loaded in the rest of the 
rest of the thing, you know, right? And, and one of the other things I like about your work, and it comes from some of your other mm. things, that, you know, the great seems to be loves of your life, which is the, the movies. <laughs> right, yes. Is, you know, because as I understand, the movies were kind of your babysitter. When they you were, were my when babysitter for seven or eight years, yeah. you know, right. Is that, th that, that informs a lot of your stories, is the, the old character actors and the little known people from those old movies, like, are scattered throughout a lot of the, a lot of the work. Right. Uh, one, one of the things, I, I, re I hadn't realized this until somebody mentioned about a month ago. They said the difference between old movies under the studio system and movies today, you know, when, when there's a package and everything, right, and it's just released through some studio, is that the movies are unpopulated between the leads and the extras. There aren't like all these you know, Preston Sturges character yeah, actors walking Eric through Moore and giving and two two lines and like taking them, just stealing the movie and walking mm -hmm. off the set and never being seen again, you know, and illuminating something like that, and like uh, the, uh, 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 you know, it's it's like, and all those character actors and stuff like I said in one of the introductions, I said, uh, you know, I said, write them, you know, while they're still alive and tell them how mu how good how much you appreciated them and how how. Uh, you know how good they are because they're underappreciated. They're, they yeah. were just totally underappreciated. I mean, they weren't. That one of the things is there were the few actors in you know in Screen Actors Guild and stuff that worked all the time. You know, right? Mm -hmm. Like 365 days a year. You know, even though they only had like two lines of movie or something, they were working like on six or eight movies at a time. You know, and those people are underappreciated. You know, and like they're just you know they're not you they're not aren't people like that anymore. You know, like yeah. John John Mahoney, people like that were the last people we had that did all these character bits mm -hmm. in movies, and not, weren't really you know like foreground and, and stuff. You know, but the movie needed them. You oh, know, absolutely. and now the movies are made so they don't need people. Between the lead, I, I know that was between. that was unpopular between there's extras yeah. and then there's the two leads, you know, or three leads or whatever, and that's it, you know, right? Amazing, amazing. But uh, yeah, I, I saw every character actor in the world that was still working in the late fifties, you know, right? You know. Well, but, um, I'd love to keep talking about this, but I'm afraid we're out of time. <laughs> oh, well, okay. um, I want to thank you for taking oh. time out from the convention to uh, join us here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Right. And you know. uh, keep those stories coming. Oh, I, I'll try. <laughs> Otherwise, right. I'll starve. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you. All right. And from all of us here at Fast Forward, this is Mike Zipser saying take care.